Well, here we are in the Christmas season. Uh, Pastor John has been uh, doing a series on the gifts of uh, Christmas, uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was his intention to do uh, a talk on uh, frankincense this morning, but circumstances being what they are, you don't get frankincense today. (laughs) Today you get the star of Bethlehem, the Christmas star. We uh, can read about the Christmas star along with the, uh, the story of the Magi, or the wise men. And that can be found in Matthew 2. I'd like to read the first 12 uh, verses of that. If you want to, there's Bibles in the pew. You can look along with me. Uh, Matthew 2, starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in Jerusalem with him. When he had called together the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly, found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, Report to me, so I too may go and worship him. He's a liar. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Let's pray for a minute. Uh, Father, we just want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the Christmas story and the wise men and their gifts and for the star that guided them to Bethlehem. Thank you for your wonderful plan of salvation and thank you for the Lord Jesus. This Christmas season, we just ask that you'd help us to remember why we celebrate and who we celebrate and help us to share with others how much you mean to to each one of us. In Jesus' name. Well, the Greek word mago is translated as wise men or Magi, depending on uh, the uh, English translation you're using. We use the terms interchangeably. I think I was uh, well into my 20s before I'd ever even heard the term Magi. It was always the wise men. And I remember putting on a bathrobe and a, and a fake beard and walking up the uh, center aisle of the church I was going to, and I was one of the wise men. The word uh, originally uh, referred to a class of uh, Persian wise men. Um, They were something like priests. They were interpreters of signs. They were astrologers. Of course, today we call Persia Iran. That's where they're from. Eventually, uh, this word magos became to be used for anybody that had any kind of supernatural knowledge. some kind of ability, a magician, perhaps. The wise men from the East were likely this type of person, astrologers, magicians, wise men. It's probable that these wise men knew Jewish prophecy. Uh, The uh, Jews had been in captivity in Babylon for for years, uh, and when they were given leave to go back home. Not all of them did. Some of them stayed there. And so I'm sure that these wise men had access to uh, 
the Jewish prophecies. You know, back uh, in those days, the idea that important events or people were heralded by uh, signs in the heavens was very common uh, in most religions of the time. Uh, astrological events were often thought to portend the birth of some great hero or a great king. And uh, people kept an eye on those kinds of things. So it isn't surprising that these magi were looking at the sky. I mean, they were astrologers. That's what astrologers do. They look at the sky. And uh, it's interesting that God would, uh, and, and makes sense, that God would announce the birth of his son in a way that these wise men would understand. They saw the star. They knew that it meant something. But how did they know? How did they reach the conclusion that the star specifically pointed to the birth of the king of the Jews? How would they come to that conclusion? Well, a couple of, couple of things. First, they'd read prophecy. Uh, for example, in uh, Numbers 24, 17, Balaam prophesies, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob and a scepter will rise out of Israel. A star and a scepter pointed to a great king that was coming. So the star is associated with kingship, Messiah, and the Jews. And, the, and these guys probably were also very familiar with the prophecies of Daniel, especially chapter 9. It gives kind of a timeline of when the Messiah was to be born. And this uh, the star shines at about that time. So they had this information, and they decided to travel to uh, Judea, to Jerusalem. We're assuming somewhere around Baghdad to Jerusalem. That's about 550 miles or so over land. You know, a trip like that in those days was really a difficult trip, dangerous trip. Uh, they didn't drive or take a bus. They, had a, they traveled in a caravan for safety, for safety in numbers, I guess. Either walked or they rode a camel or in a sedan chair. Anybody here ever ride a camel? A few of us have. I can't imagine riding a camel for 550 miles. I'd be seasick in the first mile and a half, back and forth. I just... It was not, a, not an easy trip, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. There were gangs of robbers that would uh, attack them. Uh, there were probably areas that were really rough terrain. The water would be scarce. So this was, this was not a trip to be taken lightly. This is a trip that would have to have a real purpose and a trip that would have good planning. But these magi saw something that convinced them that they needed to take this difficult trip to Israel. Well, nobody's certain what star the wise men followed. Uh, or rather, it was even a star. We don't even know that for sure. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about exactly what it was that they followed. Some people believe it was an actual star or maybe a supernova. Uh, some say that it was a comet. Some say that it was an alignment of planets that happened. And there's data to suggest that each one of these things actually happened during a few years of this time period. But you know, each one of these things is spectacular, but they don't fully satisfy the details of a straightforward reading of Matthew 2. They don't quite fit. Um, none, of the, none of these uh, speculations explains how the star went ahead of them. Uh, they don't explain how the star stood over the place 
where Jesus was. Those are not natural phenomena. In fact, I, I, I kind of remember the uh, pillar of cloud and pillar of fire that led the uh, Israelites out of, out of Egypt. Those were unnatural things, supernatural things. There's no known natural phenomena uh, that would be able to stand over Bethlehem like that. You know, the rotation of the earth always makes the, the stars look like they're moving. So, this star was uniquely designed and was made by God for a very special purpose. It's fitting that God used a, a celestial object to announce the, the birth of Christ. You know, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And there you have it. In my personal opinion, I've done a lot of study on this. What I believe is that the star of Bethlehem was a supernatural phenomena that announced a supernatural event, which was the virgin birth of the Son of God. Whatever it was, it was significant that, uh, that these men would follow it. Interesting that God chose to guide astronomers by a star. I want you to think for a minute, what was the purpose of this star? You think about it, you'll find that it had one purpose, and one purpose only. And that purpose was to guide men to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only reason it existed. Today, the star acts to remind us of, of Jesus' birth. You know, the, the host of angels that we read about and didn't come down to the head priest and the religious leaders uh, of, the Jew, of the Jews. It came down to the lowly shepherds. Likewise, it, the star didn't appear to the scholars and the scribes uh, in, in uh, Jerusalem. Instead, it was shown to these, these Gentile wise men from another country who normally would be uh, scorned by the Jews as pagans. The star reminds us that uh, the gospel isn't just for the religious. It isn't for the, just the neat and tidy. Um, it is, it's for poor shepherds and for, for the pagans. It's for everybody. The father announced the birth of his son to the most unlikely candidates. And by doing that, he showed his love for all of humanity. When he did that, he showed how he desires all of humanity to come to him. The gospel is for everyone. And as Christians, we've, you know, we have the honor of sharing it with other people. It's more than an honor, really, it's a sacred duty to share it with other people. So does the Christmas star still exist today? Is there still a light that guides people to Jesus? You know, this time of year we see the Christmas star everywhere. Everywhere you look, you see the Christmas star. It's on nativity scenes, it's on Christmas trees, it's in store windows, it's on the front of your bulletin, it's up here on the wall behind me. When we see the Christmas star, we can't help but think about the birth of Jesus. It's a reminder. But you know, there's a lot of people that just would, would never think of Jesus otherwise. They let Sunday go by without any thought of God. Easter doesn't even get their attention. But Christmas comes along, and Christmas cannot be avoided in this country. You see all kinds of reminders, all kinds of reminders of the Christmas star. And everybody knows the story. Everybody knows that the star stood over where Jesus was in Bethlehem. 
So the star takes us to that manger in Bethlehem, even for people who are unchurched. The Magi searched for the baby Jesus. They had the star to guide them. But you know, mankind searches for light in the darkness. People rail against the dark. Um, John D. Rockefeller, you've heard that name. He was the richest man in the world during his lifetime. Uh, He founded Standard Oil. Now, when we think of oil companies, we think of gasoline and oil for our cars. We think of diesel fuel for the trucks that uh, drive our commerce. We think of the fuel for the machinery that uh, powers our industry and keeps our civilization going. But that's not what made Rockefeller rich. What made Rockefeller rich was kerosene. Kerosene for lamps. That's what made him the richest man in the world because people rail against the dark. And the world is a dark and a hopeless place. It's spiritual darkness. People stumble around in their spiritual darkness and looking for a a star to guide them to where they should go. But guess what? You are the Christmas star. In Matthew 5, Jesus had this to say. He said, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. Let it shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Christians are the light that leads people to Jesus. Christians live lives that shine in the dark. They share the gospel with others. They pray for the lost. They stand firm for Jesus. Interesting point that I hadn't thought of before. Every single Christian, every believer, at some point in their lives, have been told by somebody else about Jesus. Every single believer, at some point, has been told by somebody else about Jesus. If you'll recall the story of the, uh, of the man who was possessed by a legion of demons living in a tomb in a cemetery and he was terrorizing the neighbors and uh, having an awful time. You can read about that in Mark chapter 5. He was in dire straits until Jesus came along and cast out the demons. And when Jesus did that, the man was transformed a completely different man. And the, the people that saw that were afraid and they asked Jesus to leave. And so Jesus was getting in his boat, getting ready to go, and this guy comes up and begs him to go with him. And Jesus said, no. He said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has, uh, has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And the very next verse tells us, So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. That man became a guiding light to Jesus. Every born-again Christian becomes a light in this dark world. And each light points to the Savior. And Jesus, who is the light of the world has strategically placed all these guiding lights all over exactly where they need to be. If you're a believer, you're one of them. 
today we are like the star of Bethlehem. God's going to convict people of their need for a Savior. God's going to convict people of their sin. And when they are under that conviction, they're going to seek the Lord Jesus. But they're going to do it through us. They'll do it through our actions, our attitudes, and our acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus. What we are, what we say, what we do, it really matters in this world. Our, our walk and our talk have to agree. Our actions are meaningless without our profession of faith. And without our profession of faith, our actions are meaningless. So to, in order to guide uh, people to, to Christ, a star has to have a couple of things. It has to, has to be in a fixed position so people can find it. And it's got to be visible. It's got to be known. Being a silent witness doesn't make it. I've talked to people over the years who said, uh, well, I live a good life. And people see that good life and uh, how joyful we are and they'll want what I've got and they'll come and ask me about it. Yeah, maybe. Try watching a movie with the sound turned off. You get kind of a sense of what's going on, but you don't get what, what's really going on without hearing it. It's the same way with our witness. The Bible tells us to let your light so shine before men. And that light is going to be a godsend to anybody who's groping in the darkness under conviction of sin. Do people see your light? Do people know that that light is energized by the Lord Jesus? Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 14. How then will they call him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? It goes on to say, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Our actions are meaningless unless we're sharing our testimony with somebody else. We have to talk about what we believe. I'm going to ask the uh, praise team to come up here. And I want to talk about something that I'm sure you've heard the term uh, there are some who say that there's a war on Christmas. Well, I don't know if there's a war on Christmas, but it really irks me when people say have a nice holiday instead of Merry Christmas. It seems like the true light of Christmas is being purposely and progressively dimmed. You know, to recognize the birth of, of the Lord Jesus is really offensive to some people. I want to read you a little news clip. This is from uh, December 13th, 2011. A guy named Eric Bowling, who uh, used to work for Fox News, did an interview with Don Barker, who is founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. They're the ones that go around the country telling people they can't put up the Ten Commandments and they can't have nativity scenes and so forth. So Bowling asked Barker why he was trying to close down a manger scene in front of a county courthouse that was nearly 700 miles away from where he lived. And Barker said that the nativity represents an insult to human nature that we are all doomed and damned. Barker said, and I quote, why was Jesus born? To save us from our sins. What an insult to suggest that we are degraded, depraved human beings. People don't like having light shined on their sins. And if they feel like the light is going to shine on their sins, they're going to want to dim that light. Don't let anybody dim your light. 
Stand firm for Christ. Let your light shine in the dark and don't make any apologies for your faith. Over 2,000 years ago, the star of Bethlehem led wise men to the Lord Jesus Christ. So in 2022, just around the corner, let your light do the same.